Just across this narrow walking bridge and in the heart of one of the busiest cities in the world is a park that's the dream of a community and also explores the possibilities of brilliant design and plant choice. You won't want to miss it, so stay tuned as we garden smart from New York City. The Safer Brand Organic Lawn Care Program makes house calls. By ordering online, the lawn you want can be delivered right to your door. The Safer Brand Organic Lawn Care Program is a proud sponsor of Public Television and Garden Smart. I should be arrested for crimes against potted plant kind. My house is where plants came to die. miracle Grow Potting Mix is designed to help grow big, beautiful plants. Everyone grows with miracle Grow. Today with Regina Meyer, who's the president of the Brooklyn Bridge Park. Regina, thank you so much for being with us. And thank you so much for being here. It's, it's just a treat to show you all Brooklyn Bridge Park. Now, this was a tremendous undertaking. It's a very large space and a challenging site. What can you tell us about the park? Well, it's a plan for a mile and a half along the Brooklyn waterfront here wow. in the New York Harbor with fantastic views of the Brooklyn Bridge, the Lower Manhattan skyline, the Statue of Liberty. And, and capitalizing on that design has been really a real treat. And, and you'll see in your, in your visit today a phenomenal design. The community fought for this park for over 20 years. Hmm. It used to be a uh, shipping, a really active shipping terminal. And then once shipping changed throughout um, the global landscape, the site became abandoned. And the hmm. community knew it would be a great, great landscape for a park. So what went into the, the whole process of, of reclaiming this space? And then what was the, what was the design intent of the space? You know, reclaiming the space was about really studying how to get people to the waterfront. Right. The community said they wanted to come down here, so we had to figure out by design how to get there. Um, the, the site, had, because it was a shipping terminal, was cut off from the community by a really famous expressway called the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. <laughs> well, you, when you have a highway cutting a community off, you have to figure out really ingenious ways to get people down here. And we've done it by really focusing on these beautiful entrances hmm. here at the southern section and then at the northern section by the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, then, by design, taking your question further, what, what we really want to do is, is focus on getting nature to the site. Right. And that's been such a beautiful experience because our visitors really get that now, as a former industrial site, it's a place to really enjoy nature in this fantastic setting. Absolutely. Well, it's a beautiful park, and, and, and as you said, this area is surrounded by concrete and skyscrapers, and what you've built here is really an oasis in, in the middle of this giant sea of concrete. Yeah, and uh, people really get that. We've had over a million visitors each year come to here so far. We've only been open three years. Um, on a typical weekend, we'll have 90,000 people walking by, wow. which is just incredible. And programs, we do a lot of free programs, movies, talks, lectures lectures, book readings, um, concerts, all of those things to get more and more people here. Um, so it's really been a, a really gratifying experience and we're thrilled that you're here focusing on our, gar our garden design. Oh, well thank you so much, Regina. Well, we're gonna go connect with Rebecca and take a look at the plants. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. 
Rebecca McMacken is the park horticulturalist at Brooklyn Bridge Park, and you have a wonderful role here, and you've been hugely involved in the establishment of this park, and of course, its day-to-day -day operation. But Rebecca, what initially got you into gardening? Well, I grew up on a hobby farm in Connecticut, and so of course, I've been gardening my entire life. Uh, I ended up doing a degree in freshwater ecology, and I think like a lot of people that were drawn to the natural sciences, I didn't spend quite enough time outside. I spent a lot of time in front of a computer. Um, so after that, I started gardening just really for fun and realized that gardening was really applied science. Um, as all gardeners know, it's experiment after experiment after experiment. And um, at the end, you don't need to defend or run statistics, you just get flowers. You also have quite a bit of experience in public gardening. Tell me about how you got involved in public gardening and what was that experience like? Well, it seemed like a really fantastic opportunity to move into a city and get all the cultural experiences of a city without having to give up horticulture. Um, it's very, very rewarding to be working in public horticulture because people thank you at least 10 times a day. They just walk by and thank you for your work. Wow. Now this is still a very young garden and I'm sure a lot of what you do every day involves overseeing construction, but you also have quite a role with the, the plant and the design as well. Right? Absolutely. Um, we care for the plants, of course, and we have to make sure that they're healthy, keep the grass green. But I definitely get a lot of time outside making sure the plants are healthy, practicing in, uh, integrated pest management, and really observing the wildlife in the park and making sure that the park is functioning in that regard. I know you've got a number of really neat ecosystems you're going to show us today. Let's dive in. Right here in the shadow of the Brooklyn Bridge, you have this really interesting landscape planted. It looks like a, a pretty well-established native thicket, if you will. Well, it's easy to forget the fact that it, everything was very recently planted. Um, we have a lot of fast-growing plants that give the effect of, of being established, but it's all very constructed. Um, this section we're in right now is a, it's a designed mimic of a woodland ecosystem. Um, and it is one of seven ecosystems that the park is really divided into. Uh, we call it the dense hedgerow because it is dense and it functions as a wind block and it also functions as habitat for migratory birds. Migratory birds really look at habitat structure before they look at whether or not there's food available. They want to know whether or not they can nest, whether or not they can hide from hawks, etc. Um, so this kind of thicket aesthetic is really important for them and as a result we get warblers and thrushes, really rare birds. Oh, wonderful. Let's talk about the maintenance of, of this, this kind of planting. Is there anything specific that you have to do um, on a day-to-day -day or a week-to-week -week basis here? Absolutely. Of course, we weed. We don't fertilize. Um, the thought process is that nobody fertilizes a forest, so why should we fertilize in here? Um, a lot of people are under the impression that deciduous trees throw their leaves away. Uh, and the reality is that they're actually carefully placing them over their roots to store them for the winter. And then as spring comes and the leaves biodegrade and get reincorporated into the soil, the tree can take up those nutrients once again. So we leave the leaves. They're called leaves. We like to leave them. Um, and, uh, and so it, it really reduces the requirement for maintenance and, and fussing and managing in there. I think it's worth mentioning while we're literally just feet away from salt water that very recently Hurricane Sandy came through here. Much of the garden was flooded. What did you learn about the plants that either you know surprised you by doing extremely well or, or others that perhaps didn't do as well? We were very surprised at some of the plants that didn't make it. Things like uh, London Plains and sweet gums, trees that are common street trees that apparently have no salt tolerance whatsoever. But there were some really uh, wonderful survivors, things like um, the honey locusts. Uh, our native inkberry, Ilex glabra, was barely touched and it's very difficult to find an evergreen that is also salt tolerant. We planted in this ecosystem as well, Lacothui axillaris, um, the coastal dog hobble. Now, not everything's just a green plant. Here you've got many wonderful flowering plants. What are some of your favorites? Uh, well, one thing that's in bloom right now is Viburnum trilobum. It's really a gorgeous shrub that is a four season interest plant. Um, it's, it's a great plant to use if you want your hydrangeas earlier in the season. It looks, it's a dead ringer for a lace cap hydrangea, the flower is. In the summer you get very, very beautiful foliage, really dark lustrous green foliage. Um, in the fall it has a deep 
burgundy fall color of the entire plant, it sort of lights on fire. And then in winter, it has beautiful red berries that are edible for humans. You can make jams out of them. But birds also love them only after they've been fermented by the freezing temperatures. Um, so in late winter, you can often see cedar wax, wax wings fluttering around, perhaps a little tipsy in your backyard. <laughs> That's great. Rebecca, one thing I love about the way you guys have designed this is that it it feels like we're actually exploring in nature. It's not that hyper-groomed kind of landscape and really, really nice. Absolutely. The designer has tried to give New Yorkers the sense of exploration, which is very rare in a city. That feeling of being able to walk through a woodland path where you don't know what's going to be in front of you, what you might find, what beautiful little flowers might be ahead. I feel like wetlands oftentimes are one of the more underrated ecosystems in the garden. In fact, many gardeners say they're, they're battling their wet spots, they're trying to get rid of them, um, but they, they really serve a very important function just in nature. You know, this is where, you know, the low points is where the water gathers after a rain, and then the plants that grow up along the edges of it are so important from a remediation standpoint. So, you know, anything that leaches from the soil, from our planting beds, into these low areas of water. Um, those nutrients or, you know, well, or any kind of contaminants, pollutants, are then taken up by the plants. So it's a very important and integral part of the garden. Absolutely. Um, they're, they're so ecologically important. Um, and not only that, but they're also incredibly beautiful. I feel like they're a real opportunity to work with plants that you wouldn't normally be able to work with. Yeah. Um, we have amazingly ornamental plants here like the swamp azalea, we have sedges and rushes, uh, swamp milkweed, March marigold, just gorgeous things that you wouldn't be able to plant in a drier system. Absolutely. And so many of those plants are, are so important from a habitat standpoint. You mentioned mm -hmm. the, the swamp milkweed. Absolutely. And just you know how inextricably linked that plant is to the monarch butterfly. Yeah, so the monarch butterfly, as you may know, uh, its populations were down by more than half this year. Mm -hmm. uh, the, it's not doing very well, and it's due to habitat loss specifically. Wow. So the more that we can plant milkweed, which is the only plant that the caterpillars can eat, the better they will be long term. Wonderful. It's absolutely important. Let's talk about the role of the wetland in this garden, because it's, it, it, of course, is it's aesthetic, mm -hmm. but it also serves a very important irrigation function sure. as well. So um, the entire park has really rolling topography and all of the water drains into this pond right here. This is the first of five ponds, um, and the water is filtered through each pond where it then goes back into a tank uh, and is reused in our irrigation system. So it's actually a, a bio machine, I think is what people call it these days. It filters the water and we reuse it. So it's a closed loop system. Right, and that's important. This is a this park is 100% organic, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So we really need to be careful about what we put down in the park because it's going to end up in our wetlands. Which, of course, anything you put down in your backyard is going to end up in a right. wetland some way or another. But here, it's all very visible. We can see the effects immediately. Of course. Now, what advice would you have for a gardener who's looking at starting a wetland? What are the challenges involved in establishing one, or is it is it as simple as just Designing a low spot? <laughs> uh, well, if you already have a low spot, of course, you're in a much better situation. Uh, right. Designing one, an artificial wetland, can be quite challenging. Um, I think that the things that we often deal with are eutrophication, having too many nutrients, especially if you're fertilizing. Right. Those, those nutrients end up in the water, and then you get algal growth. Um, and then uh, invasive plants, of course, even though this is an entirely constructed wetland, we still have Phragmites purple loosestrife, even cattails, a lot of the same plants that people struggle with in a natural setting we have to battle here. Rebecca, some of my favorite plants in a woodland setting are the spring ephemerals, and you've got a great collection of those right here. Thank you. Um, it's something that we've only been able to plant recently as the park has developed. When everything was first planted, of course, it was all full sun because all of our trees were quite small. Uh, but now that the trees are much larger and we have shaded areas, we've been able to really expand our collection. Um, some of my favorites are, uh, we just planted the Dicentra aurora, 
um, which is a marvelous native dicentra that is not ephemeral. So we get to keep the beautiful silver foliage all year. Yeah, it's also you know really nice, clean white flower. Shows up well against that glaucous blue foliage. Um, what are some of the plants that you have in this planting that uh, you particularly like? Um, well, my favorite, of course, is uh, the columbine, Aquilegia canadensis. Um, it's just gorgeous to see red in the spring. Um, and I, I personally love it because it is pollinated by hummingbirds. Uh, bees can't see red. And when you look at the structure of the columbine, it's, it's very clear how the hummingbird would enter and would pollinate the flower. We don't have hummingbirds in the park quite yet, so I'm planting as many hummingbird plants as I possibly can. Wonderful. And you've got some others that are coming up here with the, uh, the Monarda that, exactly. that can be a great hummingbird plant. Some other wonderful perennials. You've got you know, the native phlox and then uh, geranium macrophyllum that's coming up with the really deep purple foliage. Exactly. Nice little dainty flowers. Yep. Some Solomon seal as well and a, a wide variety of asters. So I think that this planting in the fall will be quite beautiful. Absolutely. One of the overarching principles of sustainable garden design is finding the plants that belong in that environment, which is a can be a difficult way to design. Um, oftentimes in garden design, we're used to deeply amending our soil and creating a scenario where the plants that we want are going to work in that scenario. And I think one of the messages of this garden is just the, the thought and the attention to detail that's gone into every separate environment, what's actually going to work well there. Right here, you've got a really unique environment that, that we, you know, I don't have in any of my gardens. Um, <laughs> but uh, tell me about, about this particular site and, and how you built this amazing salt marsh. Well, um, it, is, it is a unique opportunity to have a salt marsh in your garden, that's for sure. Um, not everybody has a river or the ocean outside of their house. We only have one plant that could possibly be planted in this, in this environment that's native to us, which is uh, the smooth cord grass, Spartina alterniflora. Um, so there's a monoculture of that down here. Um, it is an important plant uh, ecologically because it really serves to build the land um, behind it because it's a, it is the only plant that can live in the water. It builds up debris like a mangrove and then other plants can then come in. It's like the avant-garde of, of earth, essentially. Um, it is important uh, for a larger reason in this context because it's a soft edge to the park. So it acts as an attenuator to uh, aggressive waves, even in places, even in events like hurricanes. So there have been proposals to build gigantic salt marshes all around the coast of in vulnerable cities like ours. So it might be an ecosystem that we'll be seeing more of in the future. Well, that'd be wonderful. Now talk to me about its importance from a standpoint of, of being a wildlife habitat. I know mm -hmm. a lot of animals rely on these kind of environments as well. Sure, absolutely. We were definitely not expecting the flush of wildlife that we immediately got after planting it. Um, almost immediately we had mallards, herons, um, uh, night herons. Uh, we've had mussels, blue crabs, but it's, it used to be an abundant ecosystem that just totally, completely coated our coast, and now it's very difficult to find. So these animals are kind of hiding out, waiting for an opportunity to use an ecosystem like this. Well, it's great you've been able to recreate that. Rebecca, let's talk about the, the front line of plants that's right on the other side of the salt marsh. Of course, these have got to be pretty durable plants as well. Absolutely, and they're great plants to use um, if you live on the ocean. Um, a lot of people like to pretend that they're inland when they live on the ocean and plant a lot of plants that will occasionally die when there are things like floods, as we've recently learned in New York City. Um, so these are things like the gray dogwood, uh, Baccarus homomifolia. Um, we have sumacs, of course. Um, and beach plum, uh, Prunus uh, murdama. Those are all gorgeous plants um, that all have incredible fall color and ornamental qualities, and they can flood now and then and deal with salt spray without any detrimental effects. Wonderful. You know, another plant that I noticed as we were walking over here was amelanchier, serviceberry, which is not one I would have expected to have been tremendously salt tolerant, but there it is in full fruit, and once again, a wonderful wildlife plant. And, uh, Absolutely. It's, it's great to see just, uh, I guess, a, an experiment going on with what's going to work here. And I think you guys have done a great job of showing off some super tough plants. Thank you. For many public parks, one of the most maintenance intensive 
parts of the park oftentimes is their lawn. You know, these are the, the spaces that are used more recreationally than the trails. You have families out here with, you know, their, their picnic lunches and, you know, if you have concerts on the lawn, those kind of things, they, they really get beaten up. And I know that you've made a commitment to this being, you know, the whole park being organic. And I'm just wondering what kind of challenges you encounter trying to not only grow an organic lawn, but grow an organic lawn that takes a lot of abuse. Well, we have, we're still figuring everything out. You know, like with the rest of the park, there's a lot of experimentation that goes on. Um, but we are very committed because it is so very important to us to be able to maintain an organic park. Um, and really, as you can see, the lawn looks pretty good. I mean, of course we have weeds, but we really make our peace with them. Clover is a nitrogen fixer and actually adds quite a bit of nitrogen for the grass. Um, so if we wanted to maintain the park as a golf course, it would be far more difficult, if not impossible. Right. But because we're just maintaining it to the point where people can really hang out, have a good time, go to a show, it's not really that difficult, quite frankly. It's proper aeration, proper irrigation, proper mowing, and that's 90% of the, of the work. We also use compost teas, organic fertilizers, any of the things that we have at our, our fingertips that we're allowed to use, of course, we do make use of. Wonderful. I want to talk about as, as an extension of the lawn, you start moving into, say, plant groups that are that are slightly larger, an emerging trend in gardening mm -hmm. now, or meadows, and then and then beyond that, even prairies. But let's talk about the meadow a little bit. I know that you do have some sections of the mm -hmm. park that are developed meadows. Um, what kind of plants do you use there, and how does that work? Well, the meadows are really fantastic because they are um, a lawn alternative, and mm -hmm. they really like the same environments that lawns like. They like full sun, lean soil, very little water on occasion, um, and they can really, if they're planted and designed properly, they're actually far lower maintenance than a proper lawn is. Um, so that's why they're gaining such popularity. They're also incredibly beautiful, mm -hmm. when, especially on a large estate when you look out and you see a huge field of grass, it's not quite as exciting as a, a prairie filled with wildflowers. It's right. so gorgeous. So you can understand why they're so popular and then why we have seven in the park. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're, and we keep on building more. They're all very different. We have one on Pier 5 that is a close mimic to the Hempstead Plains of Long Island. So mm -hmm. it's all the similar plants that you would find in the middle of Long Island. Um, we have one that is more closer to uh, a tundra that has a lot of trees in it and even some shrubs. Um, we have wet meadows and dry meadows because they all utilize different types of plants and they're really gorgeous. I think, I think another reason why they're so exciting for people is because it's really utilizing American plants uh, in a design aesthetic that is an American design aesthetic. Yeah. And for a very long time, we've been using European plants to try and make European gardens. And now there's this movement of using our plants, which, by the way, could not be more popular in Europe. Right. Um, <laughs> but uh, to create designs that really define who we are as a country and a continent. Rebecca, you've done such a wonderful job here. The Brooklyn Bridge Park is a great place for people to come see their native plants also growing organically in a pretty tough environment. Absolutely. I think the really fascinating part, too, is the fact that this entire park, all of this lush greenery and all of the ecosystems that we've covered are essentially growing on a bare concrete slab. It's all artificial. So, you know, the reality is that if we can do this here, anybody can do it. You know, they say if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. And we certainly think that's the case with organic native plants. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you. Another show, another amazing garden. We hope you've enjoyed this episode as much as we've enjoyed producing it. If you watch the show, you know we travel the country visiting beautiful gardens. Well, we have a surprise in store for several in the audience. To learn more about the surprise, visit our website at gardensmart.com. The Safer Brand Organic Lawn Care Program makes house calls. By ordering online, the lawn you want can be delivered right to your door. The Safer Brand Organic Lawn Care Program is a proud sponsor of Public Television and Garden Smart. I should be arrested for crimes against potted plant kind. 
else is where plants came to die. Miracle Grow Potting Mix is designed to help grow big, beautiful plants. Everyone grows with Miracle Grow. The commitment to garden organically with native plants can be a bit daunting, but today we've learned that carefully selecting plants that are perfectly well adapted for their environment not only make the job of the gardener easier, but deliver outstanding results. If you have questions about anything you've seen today, visit us on the web at Gardensmart.com. And remember, even if you're a master gardener, there's always more to learn. So join us next week for more great gardening tips and ideas as we Garden Smart.